Today's scripture is taken from the Gospel of Mark, the ninth chapter, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. So as I mentioned earlier, today is the last Sunday in that church season that we call Epiphany. The first Sunday of Epiphany starts traditionally with remembering Jesus' baptism. And heaven opened up and the Holy Spirit came down and said, you are my son, whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. And today, the last Sunday of Epiphany focuses on the transfiguration of Jesus. The word transfiguration means a change of appearance, but not necessarily a, a change overall. In our gospel reading today, Mark tells us how Jesus goes up on the mountain with three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and something amazing happens. If you recall, it says, his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. He saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. Peter and his companions saw the glory of God and the two men standing with him. The glory of God shone directly for Peter, James, and John to see. And it's an undeniable confirmation of who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God. When Jesus undergoes this dazzling transfiguration on the mountaintop, nothing about Jesus actually changes at all. The fullness of his divinity has been there all along. What changes is that his closest friends, his disciples, see that divinity unveiled for the very first time. They now have a more direct experience of the truth that Jesus has been telling them all along. They see Jesus as divine. They hear God's voice proclaiming him to be his beloved child. In other words, what happened to Jesus may not be the point of this story at all. What happened to the disciples, the viewers, the witnesses, that is what matters immensely. At mountaintop moments, reality is revealed, not transformed. That's why it feels so necessary to me right now, so urgent, that we see things in a different way, that we view the world in the light of faith in order to see reality more clearly. Because when we see reality more clearly, we respond to the world in a different way. We know in our bones the interconnectedness of all beings, the web of mutuality and interdependence that we have is revealed to us. And honestly, I can't think of a single more effective way to change how we see the world than through prayer. We can't conjure up a mountaintop experience whenever we want one, but we can pray. Always, we can pray. We can pray without ceasing. Consider this question, if God answered all of your prayers tomorrow, would it just change your life or would it change the world? My response is this, prayers don't have to be answered to change our lives. Praying itself changes us. Praying for others connects us to them. Praying for an end to the things that harm others, especially those on the margins makes us more aware of ways that we can change our hearts and beliefs and actions, which also means that prayers don't have to be answered to change the world because the world is changed when we 
are changed. The world is transformed when we see things in a new way. When the eyes of our faith are opened, when we see the world with more compassion and more hope, more clarity, we see Christ reflected everywhere. That is the change that the world needs. That is the change that we need, and it's already happening. So today's reading, the transfiguration, is really about transformation. Who has seen some of those Transformers movies? You know, the ones where the you know, yellow and black Volkswagen Beetle changes into some big robot named Bumblebee. But the sort of transformation that we see in our reading today is not like that. Jesus is not being transformed into something different from himself. This transfiguration event is so strange and awesome that when we read the story about it in Luke's gospel, Luke is at a loss to describe it. Luke says, And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning, we are told. How? How did this happen? What did it look like? How did the disciples feel when they saw it? We don't know, but we can wonder. And the mystery of not knowing invites us into the mystery of the transfiguration as well. In the mystical events of the transfiguration, Christ's body is reflecting God's glory. But what of Christ's body in the world today? We are the body of Christ. He has no hands but ours. He has no feet but ours. We are, all of us, are called to be members of the body of Christ, his church in the world today. And the body of Christ is still being transfigured, transformed, changed, renewed by the glory of God. Antonio Stradivarius was a poor Italian violin maker who lived from 1644 to 1737. At a recent count, there were 512 of the Stradivarius violins still out in existence. And each of them was worth several million dollars. The reason they're so valuable is because of the rich and resonating sound that they produce. What's more surprising is that these instruments were not made from treasured pieces of wood, but from discarded lumber found in a nearby harbor. Stradivarius took those waterlogged pieces of wood to his shop where he cleaned them up and transformed them into precious violins. Just as that poor violin maker transformed discarded wood into treasures, God wants to transform each one of us into the treasured image of his son. God is tra continually transforming God's church to be more and more like Jesus. If only we will be open to that transformation, we will seek to, to be Christ's body in this place. We'll learn to express the radical hospitality and love of God for everyone. And we're still learning. We're still being transformed. In the story of the transfiguration, notice that it's when Jesus went up to the mountain to pray that this extraordinary transformation took place. It's God's role to transform God's people, but it's our role to put ourselves in the path of God's grace. Through prayer, through listening, through the means of grace, through the openness to what the Holy Spirit is saying right here and right now at Rapid City First. God remains unchanging, but we, God's people, are continually being transformed to be more like Jesus so that we can reveal more of Jesus to the world. Just as Jesus was transfigured on the mountain to reveal more of his true self to his disciples, and this change, this transformation, starts for us as it did for Jesus with prayer. Christian author and minister Tony Campolo once shared this story about a drunk named Joe who was miraculously converted at a homeless mission. Prior to his spiritual transformation, Joe was a hopeless alcoholic, but God had a different plan. 
During a Christian service at the mission, Joe made a profession of faith. And as a result of his decision to follow Christ, Joe was given strength from the Holy Spirit to resist alcohol. In his discipleship, he became compassionate and was a regular volunteer at the mission. No task was too lowly for Joe. He cleaned up the vomit of alcoholics, he scrubbed toilets, he assisted men who were too drunk to find their way to their bunks, and he always maintained a smile. One night at a mission service, an appeal was made for others to give their hearts to Christ. One alcoholic came forward and prayed, Oh God, make me like Joe. Please make me like Joe and repeated this over and over. And finally, the director of the mission said, I think it would be better if you prayed, make me more like Jesus. And the man looked up and said, is he like Joe? <laughs> My question is this. If a person didn't know anything about Jesus, would they see Jesus in us? Would they want the faith that we have? Something else happened up on that mountaintop at the Transfiguration. A cloud appeared and a divine voice said, this is my son, listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. That divine voice is calling Peter, calling James and John, and calling us, calling all followers of Jesus to a different attitude. The divine voice is giving us a model for how we should react when we encounter the glory of God in Jesus. The divine voice says, listen, stop trying to understand the moment and just listen. There's something important about listening because if you're willing to listen, you're willing to be changed. That's why when we argue, we raise our voices and we interrupt because we're not willing to listen. We don't want to be changed. We don't want to learn something new. We don't want to be moved. This is my son. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Because if you listen to Jesus, you will be changed. You can't possibly stay the same after listening to the Son of God. If you listen to Jesus, you'll be cha changed, you'll be moved, you'll be transformed. When we listen to Jesus, we can and will be transformed. This transfiguration we're talking about is an invitation to be transformed by the transforming power of God. So let's pray that we can be continually changed and transformed to be more like Christ. Let's pray that the body of Christ here at Rapid City First will go on being transformed and renewed in the likeness of Christ. Let's pray that by God's grace we can show the world more and more of who Jesus is until the whole church is showing the whole Christ to the whole world and we can truly say all are welcomed, all are loved, all are called into God's kingdom. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you're coming from, come as you are and be met, loved, and transformed by the living, risen Christ. Through prayer, we remain in contact with the heart of God, which allows God's love to transform and transfigure us and to burst forth in goodness. That's how we allow the glory of God to be seen in us and through us. Transfer Transfiguration means to be shot through with the presence of God. Our life as Christians is about being transfigured by the Spirit of God so that God is seen in and experienced through us. It takes faith and perseverance to allow ourselves to be tempted by the passion, hope, and vision of God rather than our own desires and wants. But if we do, the living word of the chosen one forms in us the heart of God. We begin Lent this week with Ash Wednesday. In a sense, it's about preparing our hearts and eyes to see Christ invading our world. We call it resurrection. That's what the discipline of Lent is all about. 
We get rid of the scales in our eyes. We get rid of the things that distract us from God's presence. We make a space, a silence, which God can use. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led him up that high mountain. Why only three? And why these three? Well, first of all, they were the inner circle. Twelve were chosen to be apostles, and they had a special role. And within the twelve, there were the three that were kind of like the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They would be the same ones who would accompany Jesus in his night of prayer when he would be betrayed at Gethsemane. They were his closest friends on earth. And the number three, I think, is significant because that's the number of witnesses needed to fully establish any matter in Jewish law. These three would officially testify to what they would see to the other apostles and to the whole world. And that means us this morning. We would have this eyewitness account of this experience through these three. We would know it's true. Years later, the apostle Peter would write about this experience. It's in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. And to me, it's very powerful. Peter writes about what it was like for him to be there and see this. Peter writes, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Peter's definitely talking about this experience at the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter says the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus were not cleverly invented myths. They were based on actual history and eyewitness testimony. Peter says we were eyewitnesses of this majesty when he was revealed. We heard this voice. We ourselves saw his glory. Peter, James, and John went up the mountain with Jesus and saw him transfigured. When they came down the mountain, he was the same Jesus, but they had seen him literally in a new light. We are called to reflect that presence of Christ within us, and we're called to do that not by becoming something or someone that we are not already, but by allowing the light of Christ that shines on us to reflect out from us into a dark and dreary world. Through this Lent and through every day of our lives with Christ, let us pursue our own transfiguration. And in time, the world is going to see us literally in a new light. For the same light that shone the glory of Christ on the mountain is going to show the glory of Christ in our lives and the promise of the glory of Christ for the whole world, beginning right here in Rapid City. That's what I see when I look out at this congregation and also imagine the people watching online. I see you transfigured, shining brightly with the power and glory of God and transformed with, into true disciples of Jesus Christ. Loving God, loving people making a difference. Let us pray. Holy Lord, as we go home today, let us live and work for Jesus because it's all true, it's real, and it matters. Thanks be to God. Amen.